Okay, so we are in this series called Unified, and um, David, this was on David's heart, uh, starting back a couple of months ago, where we actually had had different plans about what, where we would be right now, and, and I know that David, and just through prayer, there was a sense that like, man, we need to, uh, to spend some time in this idea of unity and being unified in some of the most divided times in the history of our nation, it feels like. Uh, among political parties and ideologies and social media takes, and this election coming up feels like this tipping point of the teeter-totter to many people. There are many people who are anxious, and many on both sides of the aisle and of the main aisle who feel that our nation won't be the same and will drastically change for the worse if the wrong person gets elected. And, and so we began a series last week called Unified to remember the commands of the Lord that even if the whole world is divided, that we would remain united in Christ. Now, these are times when we need to say we need to remain united. And so David began this series last week with a challenge to us as Christ followers to remember that our citizenship is in heaven first as Christ followers. That those of us who follow Jesus belong, in a sense, to the party of the kingdom of God. That's our first party affiliation, right? It's kingdom of God. And that, we, and that that needs to supersede any other party affiliation that we have on earth. And so it's important that we approach this season and as we live in this culture that we remember that our allegiance and unity to one another who have surrendered to Christ first, right? That was what David talked about last week. Well, today I'm gonna talk about what to do when unity is broken. What do you do when you have somebody in the body of Christ who wrongs you? or anyone for that matter who wrongs you, someone who sins against you. So this week I'm gonna talk primarily about our heart toward God and what to do when that happens. Next week David will talk more about how to work it out with that person who wrongs you or maybe you have a significant disagreement with. And this is a topic that Jeff preached on when we were in the Matthew series and David actually talked about this same topic in the Ephesians series. It's just such an important topic, it feels like something that we need to come back to again and again. Uh, and so, and to introduce it, so introduce this topic, we're gonna go back to, we're gonna look at a parable that Jesus told in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18. And I'll give you the exact reference in a little while, but for starters, I wanna start by sharing from the middle of that story, okay? So there's, and this is the story that Jesus is telling. He says, there's this servant of the king. We'll call him Todd, okay? So Todd, the servant of the king. Todd earns the wages of a typical day laborer, which was a denarius a day. So a denarius was this unit. It was a silver coin, and it was what normal day laborers were paid for a day's work. Todd made a denarius a day. One, and so there was another servant that Todd worked with who owed Todd 100 denarii. That's 100 days labor. Todd apparently had lent some money to this guy or something, and so this other servant, this friend of Todd, owed Todd 100 denarii. That's 100 days wages. So Todd is going and demanding that this guy pay him back. That's how the story goes. Well, 100 denarii, that may not mean much to us, so let's put this into today's terms a little bit. So, so Todd was a typical day laborer, maybe like a, let's say a McDonald's worker, like a typical McDonald's worker. The average McDonald's worker makes about $15 an hour. That's not the minimum, but that's what the average is in our nation. That's about $120 per day if you're working eight hours. Well, if you work five days a week, you'll make about $29,000 a year. Okay, a typical McDonald's worker. So 100 days of wages, which is what this fellow servant owed Todd, is about $12,000. So you imagine you're Todd, and you're making about $29,000 a year, and maybe you've got a family to feed and rent to pay, and you've got to put gas in the car, and some dude owes you $12,000, and they're not paying you back. Is that affecting your life? Probably, right? Like, that probably feels like a heck of a lot of money. And so you're probably not super happy with this person. And so in the story, Todd gets rough with this other servant of the king that he works with. And he says, you need to pay me what you owe me. And the guy pleads with him. He's like, please have patience with me and I'll pay back everything I owe you. But Todd has had enough. He's like, enough time has gone past. And he throws this guy into prison. 
Well, when Todd's boss, who's the king, because remember, he's a servant of the king, when Todd's boss finds out about this, he calls Todd in, and he's angry, and he basically says, in more words or less, Todd, what are you thinking? And then he throws Todd into prison for the rest of his earthly life. That's basically what happens in the parable that Jesus' story. Does that sound fair if we only see this part of the story? Why is the king so mad at Todd when the other guy was the one who didn't pay him back? And that's an important question in this story because the next thing that Jesus says is that the king in this story is God and Todd is us, those who follow Jesus, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus. And he says, if we act like Todd, that is how God will treat us. What's going on here, right? There must be more, and there is. So let's look now at, and read the whole story. And it started with a question that Peter asked Jesus. Okay, so let's turn to Matthew, if you've got your Bibles or a phone. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, and it will be on the screen also. Okay? So here's this conversation that started from Peter talking to Jesus. It says, Then Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and then I forgive him? As many as seven times? So he's asking, how, often, how many times should I forgive my brother, right? And this is what Jesus, uh, this is, what Jesus is talking about in the parable. This, this is about forgiveness. Okay, so now reframe what we just talked about in terms of forgiving other people. Now Peter, when he asked Jesus this question, probably thought he was being pretty gracious because a common teaching of rabbis at the time was a rabbi would teach that if your brother sins against you, you can forgive him up to three times. And so Peter's like, well, with Jesus, he's more gracious, so I'm going to like multiply that by two and add one, right? So he's like, so should I, should I forgive him seven times, Jesus? Is that pretty good? And this is what Jesus says. I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven times. Jesus said, that's how many times you should forgive your brother. That's a lot of times, right? At that point, who's keeping track? And that's Jesus' point. In other words, Jesus is like, don't keep track, forgive. Let that be your normal operating mode. When somebody sins against you, forgive. That's when he begins telling this story. Let's look at it, starting verse 24, or 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him, this is Todd, who owed him 10,000 talents. And, said he could, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Like in payment of his debt, he, was, he and his family were going to be sold. So the servant, Todd, fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. He canceled it. You no longer owe me. I'm going to let you go free. I'm having pity on you. He canceled Todd's debt. He said, we're square. I release you. So the king had mercy and forgave Todd's debt. Now, before we move on, let's take a look at what it was that Todd owed the king. Sometimes that, you know, when we read scripture, we can gloss over things because we don't know quite what they mean. So we don't know the significance, and so we want to talk about what a talent is. So first of all, do you remember how much Todd's fellow servant owed, owed Todd? How much did he owe? A hundred talents, right? Not hundred talents, hundred denarii, hundred days labor, yeah? How much did Todd owe the king? And by the way, I remember, that's about $12,000, right? That's $12,000 that this guy owed Todd. Now, how much did Todd owe the king? Todd owed the king... 10,000 talents, not denarii, talents. One talent was worth 6,000 denarii, 6,000. 6,000 days wages for one talent, Todd owed the king 10,000 of those. Todd owed the king 60 million denarii, okay? 60 million. In today's terms, that's about $7.2 billion. I mean, you have any idea how much money that is? I mean, 
So, so again, just to put things in today's terms, Todd the McDonald's worker, who makes about $29,000 a year, owes the king $7.2 billion. At his current level of pay, Todd would have to work for about 264,000 years to pay the debt he owes the king. That's if he doesn't buy anything else. He's just paying back the debt. That's over 2,000 lifetimes that he would have to work. Or if you hate math and you're like, I don't like numbers, okay, picture this, okay? Maybe you're visual. So imagine you decide to start this craft project, okay? And you're gonna start taking dollar bills and taping them together into like a road, like a, like a Christmas ornament thing, right? Like you're making it into a road of dollar bills taped together end over end. Well, at your current level of pay, okay, Todd is, again, he's making about $29,000. If you tape just over $10,000 together, it would reach about a mile, okay? So Todd's current level of pay per year is reaching about three miles, $29,000. Do you know how long, so if you continued that craft project and you're like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep putting these together until I've got $7.2 billion bills end over end, you know how far it would reach? It would reach to the moon and then back to the earth and then back to the moon again. That's how much Todd owed the king, okay? My first question after reading this is, what the heck did Todd do? <laughs> the, the, it doesn't answer, it doesn't answer, but like, did he like gamble away the king's island or something? Like, how did this happen? I don't know, it doesn't say. But suffice it to say, there is no point, and this is Jesus' point, there is no way that Todd could ever pay that debt back. It was impossible. And the king canceled that debt and released the servant. He was free. Okay? And guys, let's pause here for a second. This is the gospel. This is the good news for us. We are all in Todd's situation. Every one of us has sinned against a holy and perfect God and a holy and perfect judge, right? And we are in massive relational debt because of that to God. We fall so short of his perfect standard. There is no possible way we can ever pay back our sin debt and be square with God. We cannot do enough good to pay God back and earn his way back into his favor, earn our way back into his favor. Again, it would be like trying to pay back $7.2 billion where you're, while you're earning 15 bucks an hour. The penalty is death and separation from God forever. That's, that's the penalty. But God in his mercy sent Jesus to square our debt that he paid by giving his life for us, our death penalty, and satisfied our massive sin debt so that by the falling on his mercy, right, and placing our faith in Jesus and his payment for our sin, and trusting that God raised him from the dead, we are released of our sin and we're debt free. And we get to enjoy life with the king forever. That's what Todd received when he was forgiven his massive debt in this story. But here's how the rest of the story goes. But when the same servant, Todd, went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, hey, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. Who does that sound like? Sounds like Todd pleading to the king, right? But Todd, instead of extending the same mercy, says this. It says, he, Todd, refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him in and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Imagine... In other words, where would that hundred denarii have gone if Todd had gotten it back from his friend? We'd have gone straight to the king, right? And along with lifetimes of other money that he would have to try to make to square with the king. It wouldn't even be close to what he owed. Todd did not comprehend the grace that had been extended to him. 
And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers, that's verse 34, until he should pay all his debt. And the king is, the king is like, hey, so you want to go back to the system of, of that person owes me, so I'm going to not forgive? Okay, that's fine. You're in jail, <laughs> right? That's the system that you want to live in. And then Jesus says, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, talking to Peter, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Todd found himself in the prison of unforgiveness because he refused to forgive. And Jesus said that those who are his followers will also find ourselves in prison when we don't forgive. Now, this may bring up a question for you. You may ask, Um, because I think this is a fair question. Does this mean that if I've placed my faith in Jesus, I have eternal life, and then somebody hurts me later on, and I don't forgive them all the way or something like that, and then I die, does that mean I'm like hell-bound, right? Like that that I'm I'm out? Uh, Because that's how the language might sound here, like you're going to prison forever. And let me say this, I'm not convinced that that's what Jesus is saying here. Because we know, again, that once we have placed our faith in Jesus, we're adopted into God's family, right? God doesn't just unadopt us when we don't get everything right. We're transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Jesus is talking to Peter here, who's one of his disciples, who belongs to Jesus, and he's telling him, hey, you're gonna be at odds with my father if you don't forgive. I don't know that he's talking in eternal implication terms, okay? I don't, I, I don't, I would say I'm not convinced that that's what Jesus is saying here. That said, I don't recommend being a test case for that. (laughs) Okay, I would not recommend, once you become aware that you need to forgive someone, of of holding on to that grudge until the day that you die, and then as you stand before God one day, go, so I know you commanded us to forgive, but I just felt like my bitterness, I just wanted to stay there, and I know that you're gracious, and I know you're gonna forgive me. I don't know that I would be a test case and try that, okay? I would say God wants you to be free of that bitterness now. And in following Jesus, what we sign up for and onto is the kind of life that extends grace and forgiveness just like he did for us. And if we don't, we will find ourselves at odds with God not unadopted, but at odds with God, and we are in the disciplined space with him when that happens. Does that make sense? Yeah? So if you find yourself that you're not forgiving others what they've done, you will find yourself in prison at odds with the Lord in this. Okay? Now what does that prison look like? Well, again, I think the main component is that you will, you're at odds with God. You're not going to have access to all that God desires for you as his son or daughter, at the very least. You're in the discipline space if you're not forgiving. But also, there, there are some common things that people may experience when they refuse to forgive. They're like side effects or symptoms, and maybe a part of this prison that Jesus is talking about. And so I want to share some of those symptoms of unforgiveness. And you can Google this, and there's actually findings even from the Mayo Clinic and John Hopkins and other places about some of the impact that unforgiveness has on people, okay? So here are some symptoms of unforgiveness that may be a part of this prison, okay? The first one is bitterness, and this is the big one. Bitterness and unforgiveness go hand in hand. Bitterness is an ongoing feeling of anger, injustice, wanting revenge, and it will eventually bleed into other relationships, So you may have bursts of unrelated anger. When you don't forgive, you carry this sense that you still are owed some sort of unsettled debt. Like a hole in you that you're gonna keep trying to fill. And it may start with just being aimed at that person, but it won't stay there. If you don't forgive, that bitterness is gonna start to come out in other places. You're gonna start exacting that relational debt from other people. Remember how the other other servants were distressed by how Todd treated their fellow servant. It started to impact other people, not just Todd. Okay? Uh, the author of Hebrews writes, this is Hebrews 12, 15. He says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many defiled. When we don't forgive, bitterness can take root and start to grow. And when it starts to grow, it will start impacting other people. It will impact your other relationships. Does that sound like freedom? Sounds like prison, right? 
Another one is impulsivity. This is when you respond impulsively, when you respond. So, you know, you're, okay, you're going to make me mad? Well, then I'm going to say things that I know hurt you. Things like that. Blaming is another. Not just for, against that person for what they did to you, but for how you responded. You'll start blaming people for things that are actually your responsibility to address. You're basically saying to the offender, I hold you responsible for my unhappiness. And this can bleed into other areas, just like the other things. The weather is bad, so you get mad and you blame the weather. This might come out as passive aggressive comments to people, you know, like, well, maybe if people actually listened to what I want sometimes, I'd be nicer. Things like that, right? Passive aggressive comments. Hurt from other things bleed into the present. Another one is obsessive, repetitive thinking. Lots of negative, deep thinking. This may mean replaying what happened over and over or having imaginary conversations where you come out the victor every time. Or it might mean desperation over wanting to make them understand how you feel or obsessive thinking about them getting what they deserve. Does that sound like freedom? It's prison, right? Again, let me say this. These are just symptoms. If you're like, oh, I do that one, that doesn't necessarily mean you have bitterness and unforgiveness. It may be something else. But if you've got a lot of these, there may be bitterness present there and unforgiveness, right? Another is control. Like this compulsion, you can't control the person who hurt you, so you'll, you may start trying to control the other things in your life. You know, maybe you're like, I, I just need to make spontaneous purchases a lot on Amazon because <laughs> it makes me feel better. Or, or check social media incessantly, or you have to have everything perfect at home or you're not happy. Again, None of those things are necessarily related to bitterness, but they might be, okay? Isolation. You may avoid closeness or intimacy with others. This, you know, this person hurting you has resulted in you not trusting other people, so you don't let anyone too close. Notice how this sounds like allowing yourself to be imprisoned and isolated away from people. Two more. One is the ability to reframe experiences, to look at an experience you had in a new or redeemed way. That's what it means to reframe it. And so I may say, I mean, I used to love going to the beach, but then this thing happened and, I, and I'm never going back to the beach. The beach is ruined for me and I, I can't reframe it because I'm holding this bitterness. The last thing I'll mention is there are actual physical symptoms that actually can result. And this is, a, um, again, I mentioned a John Hopkins study. A uh, John Hopkins study revealed that unforgiveness is linked to higher incidences of stress, heart disease, high blood pressure, lower immune response, anxiety, depression, and other health issues. Again, are they all related to bitterness? No, not necessarily, but they may be. Okay, another physical symptom was difficulty sleeping. So these are all possible symptoms and all things that may be a part of this prison that Jesus is referring to when we don't choose forgiveness. And God, our King, wants us to be free. He wants us to walk closely with him, enjoying him. So um, to go forward, let's talk about what forgiveness is and, and what it isn't, and then we'll talk about how specifically we can forgive, okay? First of all, this is something forgiveness is. Forgiveness is choosing to release the person who hurt you of the relational debt that they owe you. Remember that the king took pity and forgave the debt and released Todd. That's what forgiveness looked like. I'm forgiving the debt and I'm releasing this person. It means I'm no longer going to entertain anger and bitterness against this person. I've released them. Forgiveness is not forgetting. I know we've heard that, forgive and forget. It's not that easy to do. (laughs) You can't just forget something that happened to you. The king, and I'll bring this back to the parable, the king did not forget that Todd had owed him that big debt, did he? Because when Todd didn't forgive his friend, the king said, hey, you remember I forgave you that debt, right? The king didn't forget it. It means, But what it does mean, it means choosing to live with the consequences of the other person's sin and not treat or think about them with vengeance any longer. I'm releasing them from, from my punishment towards them. And on this, sometimes we need to choose to remain in that posture of forgiveness because we may remember and get mad again. Anybody ever have that happen to you? I know for me that's been the case 
where like I'm in this ongoing conversation of I am so mad at this person. No, but God, I said, I chose to forgive, but I'm so mad they did this and I want this to happen. No, I release that to you, God. I give it to you. I choose a posture of forgiveness. Thank you that you forgave me. And that may happen numerous times because of the same thing, but we're choosing a posture like the king chose. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, so it's not forgetting, but it may mean reminding ourselves that we chose to forgive. Forgiveness is, firstly, about getting our own heart clear and free. Although forgiveness means you're relating to and thinking more rightly about the person who offended you and the situation which can lead to greater restoration in that relationship, forgiveness starts as an issue between you and the king. The king said to Todd, hey man, we're at odds because you're not forgiving. And this is us saying to the king, I want my relationship and my heart before you to be right and to walk in your grace. So forgiveness is firstly about getting you out of prison and into God's grace. It's about you being free. Forgiveness is not, though, minimizing what happened to you. You're not saying it was okay. You're certainly not saying that it didn't matter. In fact, the first step to forgiveness is remembering and acknowledging how the person wronged you. The king was looking at the debts owed him. Remember, he was taking account. He was remembering, okay, this guy owes me a debt. That's the first step. The debt was real, but then you're choosing to forgive and release them from your own anger and wrath. Okay? Forgiveness is a justified response when we're hurt. Why? Because Jesus giving his life for us and forgiving our massive sin debt gives the justification for why we can and must now forgive others. God has forgiven us so much more. Remember how much the king forgave Todd. We are in that same boat. We want to follow in the footsteps of our master. Forgiveness is not, and this is important, forgiveness is not saying there should be no consequences for that person. I think this is important. Okay, the most loving thing for the person and for others in the scenario that you need to forgive may be that the offender experiences the consequences of their actions. There was a time when I was in, uh, I lived in Monterey, Mexico. I used to be on staff with Back to Back Ministries. And we worked with this children's home that was out in the country called El Retiro. And there were, it was this really cool place. They had a lot of property, orange trees, other fruit trees, guava. It was really cool just trying to paint a picture of the place. So anyway, went out there one day, and there was a young man, we'll call him Arthur, and Arthur got into my back-to-back money pouch and stole about $50 out of that back-to-back money pouch. He was one of the kids that lived at the children's home there. Well, his mom was visiting him. It might have been the same day or that he stole it, or it might have, he might have stolen it a couple of days before. And if that's confusing, by the way, why is his mom, he has a mom and he's in a children's home? Well, yeah, a common scenario that was happening in Mexico at the time was mom can't take care of their kid, maybe dad left, mom can't afford, I want my kid to have four, three square meals a day and get what they need, so I'm gonna take them here and visit them when I can. Meanwhile, they're getting what they need, I'm trying to make enough to get my kid back. That's, and so mom had come that day to visit and she found out that he had stolen this money and bought a bunch of things with it. And so she brought him to me and shared this with me. And my first thought and my first thing I did was I forgave him. I didn't even tell him I forgave him. I just said, God, I I released this boy. Thank you that you love me and I choose to forgive him. However, I also felt like having forgiven him, the most helpful and loving course of action for this young man was to allow him to experience some of the consequence of what he had done. And so I spoke to Arthur pretty sternly. And I said, man, how am I supposed to trust you? Like you stole from me, buddy. I love you, but man. And then Arthur watched as his mom took $50 or the equivalent in pesos out of her wallet and paid me. That was a ton of money for her but she's like, I wanna make sure that you're square. And I took it. And I think it was the right thing for me to do. Because I felt like 
First of all, it wasn't my money, it was back-to-backs that was stolen. Second, one of the most painful things that Arthur had experienced was watching his mom have to pay back for this debt that, because he had stole. And I do think it dramatically changed some things in his life. When I saw Arthur further down the road, it was a different kid. I don't know if it was all because of that moment, but I think that moment had something to do with it. And he had changed in many ways for, toward the Lord. It was awesome. Okay, so the idea there is that it's not that that person isn't gonna experience consequences. Plus, even though you're letting them off your hook by forgiving, that does not mean, and hear this, that does not mean they're off God's hook, okay? Romans 12, 19, Paul writes that the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. The Lord saw what happened. That person who hurt you is still accountable to the king. We all are accountable. Know this, the king sees you. And he sees what was done to you. And that person who hurt you is going to have to answer to the Lord for what they did to you. It may not be immediately, it may be later, but they will answer for it. And that is why we want to extend grace to others. Because we we want God to extend grace to us and we would not want to pay for our own sins. And so we pray about that person, God, oh, let that punishment for them fall to Jesus. Because man, I don't want it to fall to them. Forgiveness is a choice we make, just like the king chose to forgive the man's debt. Forgiveness is not a feeling, okay? We must make the choice to forgive first. I do not recommend waiting until you feel like forgiving because you'll never get there, most likely. We make the choice. The feelings likely will follow as God meets meets us with his grace. Forgiveness is an act of love, okay? It's extending grace and mercy and releasing the person from your own judgment, resentment, and hatred and punishment into God's hands. Forgiveness does not mean continuing in unwavering trust for that person, okay? Forgiveness is granted, trust is earned. Very important distinction. Does that make sense? Forgiveness is granted, trust is earned. This is scriptural. You may remember a parable that Jesus told of of this master giving money to three of his servants, and two of his servants took that money and they were faithful with it and they produced more, and the last servant was unfaithful with it, and the And that master came back and and said, well done, good and faithful servant to the two who had been faithful. And he said, I'm gonna give you more. And to the guy who wasn't faithful, he said, I'm taking your coin back. And it's the same, that's what trust is, right? Just because I forgive someone doesn't mean I trust them. And that's the case, right? Um, It doesn't mean saying everything is okay and staying in that same situation with that person who hurt you and being a doormat, okay? It may mean, hopefully that trust will be restored in time, that would be the desire of God, but that may not be the case right now and you may still need to have a tough conversation, you may need to set some boundaries and you may even need to put relational distance between yourself and that person, because of that hurt. You don't want to remain in that situation, right? I need to trust you before I'm going to be this close again. There was a guy, uh, I'll share this one last story, and then we'll talk about steps to forgive. A few years ago, we owned this old Toyota Corolla, and we had bought it for about 150 bucks, and then Jody's dad, um, Poppy, helped us um, restore it because he's a mechanic. And so we had this car that we paid 150 bucks for, and it was a Toyota Corolla, which is like gold. They go forever, right? And so, uh, but it didn't look very good. It was very ugly. Um, And so we uh, drove that for a long time. Well, there was a guy that I met at the apartment complex behind my house, and he was a veteran, and he was trying to get back on his feet. And I got the sense, I I, I really cared for this guy. He had been, I think, discharged from the, the armed forces because of a medical issue. He had some kind of like a seizure thing or something, and so he couldn't continue. He's trying to figure out his life, get back on his feet. And he came to me one day, and he's like, hey, can you give me a ride somewhere? And I couldn't. I just didn't have the time. And he asked me a couple times. He needed to go somewhere. I'm like, I just, shoot. So I said, hey, man, 
can I just, he, he had his driver's license and stuff, and I said, can I just lend you my car? He said, sure. So he went and took my car, brought it back. Next day, he off, asked to use my car again. I said, sure, man. Went and took my car, brought it back. And then he asked me to use my car again. I was like, sure. So he took my car, brought it. I was totally fine with this. And then the one night, he said, I'm gonna, is it okay if I park it at my house tonight because I've got to take it somewhere this, in the morning? I said, sure. Well, then there came a day when I needed it. And so I, I texted him, and I said, hey, man, um, I need my car uh, tomorrow or whatever at this time because I, I need it for an errand. And I didn't hear from him. I'm like, okay, weird. I hope everything's okay. And then the next day, I get this call from the police. <laughs> and the police are like, hey, is this your car? And I was like, yeah. And they said, do you know where it is? I was like, no, I lent it to a guy a few days ago and I tried to text him to get it back and he hasn't brought it back. And they said, your car was used in a robbery. I'm like, great, awesome, this is super, okay? So um, I'm like, okay, what do I need to do? And apparently some items had been stolen from the apartment complex and re been reported stolen and then they were taken to this recycling facility and they were flagged because they tried to sell them at the recycling facility. And so I was like, okay, yeah, that's not cool. So I sent this dude a text. I'm like, I need you to bring my car back right away or I'm gonna have to press charges. Because now I'm thinking, okay, what's this gonna do to my insurance? Am I gonna get in trouble? Is my family gonna be hurt because this guy has my car and it's attached to, to this name? So I said, I need you to bring it back. I gave him a chance. He still didn't bring it back. So. Uh, I'm like, yeah, go ahead, put a warrant out for his arrest. And so he's driving without consent. And, uh, and so finally the cops found him and his girlfriend. They had the car. They were living out of it. They had set up a, like a tent. They were doing drugs out of it. They were just sort of living out of it. And, uh, and I was like, man, okay. And then my car got impounded because that's what they have to do. They have to tow the car. Well, they couldn't pay me to get my car out of the impound lot. So my car was gonna cost 150 bucks to get out, which is how much the car was worth like years before. I'm like, I can't, I can't really afford that right now. So I guess I'm just gonna leave it. So I left my car, I went and got a bunch of stuff out of it, including some of their stuff, because they were like, yeah, we left some things in it. Can you get them out for us? I'm like, sure. So I got stuff out, brought them back. They very tearfully came to my house and I handed their stuff back to them and, and I told them I forgave them, et cetera. Now here's, and I did, I really did. But, but here's a question. Do you think I'm gonna lend my car to that guy again? No, <laughs> I don't trust that guy, right? I love him, I pray the best for him, but I don't trust him and that's okay, right? So, how do we forgive? And this is on the app. You can see this on the app. These are steps to forgive. These are very practical steps to forgive. And we'll leave them up during communion so that you can go walk through them if you're ready to forgive somebody, if God's bringing someone to mind. So here are some steps. This is a little bit more drawn out, but it's like, hey, we're talking about forgiveness, so how about we really cover it well? So here are some steps to forgive. Once you remember that somebody has done something wrong to you, Step one, bring to mind that person who hurt you and what he or she did. Who hurt you and what did they rob you of or take from you? Bring it to mind. In the case of my car, it wasn't just my car that was taken. It was trust. It was peace of mind. It was a sense that like, man, like of just feeling like I, I tried to help you and you threw it back in my face, right? Right? What was taken from you? What's the relational debt that is owed? Two, allow yourself to remember the pain of what was done to you. That may sound weird, like, wait, aren't I a Christian though? I'm not supposed to think about that? No, you need to remember the pain. You need to remember what you, was done in order to truly forgive that person. Because you gotta acknowledge that this was a debt, just like the king, again, brought to mind, oh, this is the account that was owed me. Third, invite Jesus to meet you in your pain. And you could pray something like this. Jesus, I invite you to meet me in this pain that I'm feeling and felt. Thank you that you saw what happened and that you see me and that you meet me here, here and now, with compassion. I give this pain to you. And allow yourself to experience God's presence with, with you there. 
Fourth, choose to forgive the person. And one way you can do it is by speaking aloud these words. I choose now to forgive so-and-so. Four, specifically, what did they rob you of? What did they do or rob you of? I bless and release this person of what they owe me. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I renounce. That means I turn away from as an option. I renounce all hatred, bitterness, resentment, and anger that I have against this person for having done this thing. Five, pray for that person. Remember how Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you? Pray for that person and release them into God's hands. You could pray something like this. God, I release so-and-so into your hands. I know that even though I am releasing them from the relational debt that they owe me, they will not escape answering to you for how they've sinned against me. I ask that in your mercy, they would come to know and trust in Jesus so that their punishment would fall to Jesus and not to that person. It's a prayer of mercy. And you can repeat those steps for each person you still need to forgive. If you will maintain and live in this posture of forgiveness, it helps us, it keeps us having short accounts, and it helps keep us in this place of being unified, particularly as with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It keeps us from seeing things through the, the lens of bitterness and unforgiveness. Well, we're gonna have a time of communion now and so prayer teams and worship team, you guys come up. If you need prayer for something, there will be prayer teams at at least a couple, maybe all of the, of the communion stations if you'd like prayer. But as you go to communion, and by the way, if you haven't made a decision yet to follow Jesus, we would just ask that you hold off on doing communion and wait, that, let, that communion be something special that you do once you've made that decision. But as you go to communion, Ask God to remind you and open your eyes to remember the incredible debt that he has forgiven in your life, that sin debt. And also, ask God, is there anybody that I need to forgive today? If someone comes to mind, you can walk through those steps that we just talked about. That would be the action step out of this. I would recommend forgiving. Yeah? Let's pray and then we'll worship God. Thank you, God, so much. We just pray that you bless this time of communion and we just pray, Lord, that you would allow anyone here who's been suffering in that prison of bitterness or unforgiveness, Lord, to be free of it. That's your heart. You desire freedom and joy. We ask that those people no longer be empowered to steal our joy, that we would release them in order that we have your joy. Thank you, God, in Jesus' name, amen.